Andrew and Ben, just returning to a subject that's been overshadowed by AI all year. Can Ben update us with his current thinking on China's chip manufacturing strategy? Bloomberg reported last week that China purchased more semi equipment in the first half of the year than in any year prior. Despite the market's focus on AI, it seems clear that China remains focused on building up their lagging edge fab industry. I think trailing edge is the word we're looking for. There you go. Um, nitpicking the emailers on this episode. <laughs> Aside from the geopolitical implications, I'm curious to know who Ben thinks is most at risk as Chinese chip volumes increase over the coming years. Is it the analog and microchip companies like Texas Instruments and analog devices? who may have to compete with a flood of Chinese exports? Are the equipment makers over-indexing to the Chinese market and at risk of a major drop in sales if more restrictions are imposed? Let's talk non-AI chips for a refreshing change. Thank you. Thank you for the note, Jason. Ben, um, do you have any thoughts? I also want to ask you about the looming ASML policy changes. Uh, but what do you think of Jason's question? Well, I mean, in general, China is going to dominate, I think, totally undifferentiated trailing edge sort of chips. So like mm -hmm. chip, like pretty bog standard. So like what something that like TSMC has done for a long time or is increasingly doing actually with trailing edge is increased sort of specialization. So whether that be analog chips or whether that be sort of like specific designs that that, that do certain things, they want to basically take the higher end of the market. So at the end of the day, like these are all fully depreciated fabs that are making, you know, 28 nanometer chips, or, or for example, they're trying to take the top end of those markets where they get a little bit more because it's like, it's a little bit more specialized and does sort of X, Y, Z. And, and China is less capable of taking that. And also, you know, just going to be relentless as far as putting too much capacity in this market and you know cutting sort of the price underneath it and they'll get away with that because the price of these chips is still is still very very low um i mean i it's it, it's i don't have a big update other than later like this was sort of my take when the chip ban sort of came down is the real risk and i think the folks that are that are truly in danger here is anyone with a dependency on these low-end undifferentiated chips they're liable to end up with a real sort of dependency on China that they may not even fully realize that they have up mm -hmm. until that sort of gets get, gets pulled. And we saw this again with sort of the automakers during COVID where they didn't even realize the degree of their dependency. In this case, it wasn't on China per se. It was just on these low end chips. And so they go in, COVID hits, they're like we have to cut our suppliers. And right. no one thinks about the fact that this $1 chip, if you cut your order, you're getting in the back of the line and it takes six months to make that $1 chip. Why does it cost $1? Well, because it's on fully depreciated equipment that's churning out, you know, like hundreds of thousands or, or millions of these things. But it's this incredibly complex process that's very different than manufacturing a transmission or a brake caliper or, or sort of whatever it might be. You know, like, like the thing about chips is they're more like software than basically any sort of physical device in their ability, you know, manufacturing at scale, all the costs being upfront, the marginal cost being effectively zero, and the high, you know, how complicated and difficult they are. And they learned that sort of the hard way. And there's tons and tons of products and industries that have these dependencies that I'm not sure they know about. And I do expect China to sort of continue coming to dominate sort of the, the lower end of the market. And at some point, it'll be discovered that there's this pain point dependency. And then I guess we'll see, we'll see what happens then. Is there any way to prevent that flood of overcapacity from hitting, say, EU markets or the U.S. market? I mean, it's really difficult to contain chips, and China's very good at rerouting some of their exports through third-party countries. Like, how would the U.S. try to do it, or is it just sort of a? Loss? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this gets gets it's put in into something that's being manufactured in China, and the chips just right there. And like what you know, like uh, you look around you, yeah. so many things have chips in them, right? Like, and you barely even think about it. And the chip costs a few pennies, or or whatever, or or, or you know, whatever it might be. Uh, so, I mean, this is the challenge of trying to do top down engineering of complex supply chains and worldwide markets. Like the the pro like we talked about this a bit in the context of like Intel, like at the end of the day, what's the market force pushing companies to Intel? Your hope is that 
AI can sort of help. Companies want to be on the leading edge and TSMC doesn't have sufficient capacity. And so Intel mm -hmm. will have a market there. But this idea of just creating demand or suppressing supply in a market that, you know, we spent 20, 30 years with basically unfettered free trade and you had we're trying to unring a 30 year long bell in this case and that's yeah. what's really difficult unsurprisingly yeah and it's it's really hard to do you know probably the most effective way to do it would be to completely and utterly cut china off from world trade uh and then you will you'll quickly discover all the holes in every supply chain that has all these dependencies and oh, by the way, you have a worldwide depression and like massive upheaval and and, uh, and you'll be totally, war. yeah, <laughs> that will, it will probably happen because of a war. And so uh, it, it's, you know, there's, I kind of said this jokingly, I, I can't remember on this podcast or whatever, but like, you know, this is why there's arguments like maybe let's just, uh, let's make nice with China, right? <laughs> like, like let's, uh, it, it's too complicated to undo and the pain is going to be so substantial to sort of figure out the other way. And I think this is, the you know, there being, of course, that China is not really looking to make nice with the West in a lot of cases. I mean, I, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting in Taiwan, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah. So, so, it, it, it's messy like and it's going to be the reality is and no one will say this sort of politically but there is the only way this truly gets unwound and mm -hmm. all these sort of dependencies and issues get figured out is basically through tremendous suffering and pain uh whether that be ideally just through the through the consumer market in a depression but more realistically via a war sort of scenario and I think Sexy's there's these mailbag Mondays were going to be light. <laughs> now here we are, tremendous suffering and pain to start off the week. But it's yeah. it's but it's a bit where all this talk about, you know, um, now, I think the hope is you can sort of tilt things, uh, whether it be, you know, both parties are basically in favor of, of tariffs at this point, um, you know, building up capacity in the U.S., but uh this is downstream of choices that were made a long time ago. Like when you let China into the WTO and didn't hold them to their obligations or whatever it might be, or, you know, like with the assumption back then that inevitably free trade will lead to sort of democracy and these sorts of bits and pieces. Uh, just because that didn't happen doesn't mean the other stuff didn't happen. It did happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's, it's going to be very complex and painful to unwind and it's hard to make it unwind when the economics just are not in favor of it unwinding at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the other end of the chip spectrum, the one other thing I wanted to ask you about, did you see the report that Bloomberg had where the Netherlands is planning to limit ASML's ability to repair and maintain its semiconductor equipment in China? These are yeah, UV it... machines, not EUV machines, but still, they've been pretty elemental to the advances that we've seen in China the last couple of years. So there's two bits here. So number one is ASM, ASML sort of being limiting sort of support, which will hurt China at the, you know, N minus two sort of like where they, you know, you don't need EUV. They don't have access to EUV, but you can get right. down to seven nanometers or so without EUV. They've sh shown seven nanometer chips, um, you know, probably realistically about 10 nanometer is realistic and not, yeah, like the machines need constant repair and upkeep and maintenance. Uh, there is a bit where in the long run, you can make the case this is good for China because, again, what China actually needs to do is learn how to make semiconductor equipment that, you know, in, in, it's hard to convey if you're trying to do, China has the same problem from a top down perspective. The push is make make our own chips, make our own chips. Well, what's the best way to make chips? buy Start western equipment to sort of make your no no but the push isn't no one in the chinese leadership cares about making 1.8 micron chips or 90 nanometer right, chips right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's where china needs to go they need to not just make chips they need to make the equipment that makes the chips and they're nowhere near doing that so the more they're cut off and this cuts them off more the more it pushes them in the arguably the better position for the very long run because they have to get back to making like figuring out how to make equipment and of course there's folks trying to do that but you know that's where more of the focus should be if i were sort of 
in charge of China. That would be that would be sort of the push. The other piece here is there China is making threats to Japan not to do the same thing for Canon and Nikon. And Japan has a lot more exposure overall economically, I think, to China. They obviously have military <laughs> exposure to China in a way that the Netherlands necessarily does not. And so that's going to be that's arguably just as important that piece of news the threats china is making to japan on right. that point they threatened severe economic retaliations and toyota in particular is pretty dependent on chinese rare earths and so toyota is opposing any sort of um any sort of japanese decisions that would imperil that supply chain yep uh and uh the rare earth thing is is interesting because rare earths are not actually that rare uh, there's huge deposits like in Chile, there's huge deposits in the U S uh, what is rare is the sort of refining capability of actually, you know, to make them sort of useful, which is uh pretty heavy, heavily polluting is sort of a dirty sort of process. And, uh, that's another reality that the West needs to make. Like you, like China has shown its willingness to leverage this rare earth point before they keep mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, are you going to actually allow stuff to be built to undo that threat? But there is just a sense where the political class wants to sort of, you know, there's a lot of pollution and sort of things that we still depend on that were shipped to uh, Asia a long time ago. And if you're serious about you building independence, <laughs> yeah, uh, that includes uh, taking some of that stuff back. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think telling and discouraging, but sort of a, a reality check, we've known about this rare earth liability relative to China for a very long time. Like people have been talking about rare earths for ages. And there's and been basically Bill no and I progress. Were about it. Like China did this in 2010 to Japan and we've 14 now years had ago. 15 years <laughs> to figure yep. out some sort of way to do there's been no, no the supply chain. There's been no shift. Like yeah. like there's I would say by and large are, you know. A failure of our politics is a refusal to look trade-offs in the face and sort of make tough choices. We just sort of kind of want to have it all. And the reality is that this China thing in so many areas kind of shoves that in our face. Like the trade-off between free trade and, and having a growing consumer market and a growing economy, the trade-off between environmental concerns and, uh, you know, access to rare earths and like having sort of leverage uh relatively speaking and until those tough choices are made and this is why you do worry about the sort of war scenario the best way to overcome a lot of trade-offs and get all of society pulling in the same direction and making necessary sacrifices unfortunately that usually happens with wars <laughs> so uh yeah it's not not great not ideal it's much easier to manufacture urgency in that scenario, but that scenario is horrific for all sorts of other reasons. Yeah.